Welcome to NCC. This is the first of four lectures that we're going to have in 2019 from the 2020 Midnight Resident Artists as they circle through their, their terms uh, in residence with us. Um, I'd like to take a moment to say thank you for, to the McKnight Foundation for the support of the residency and fellowship programs hosted through the organization. Uh, since 1997, the uh, McKnight Foundation has enabled NCC to award fellowship opportunities to makers across Minnesota and residencies for those outside of the state and across the rest of the world. Uh, these opportunities offer incredible support to each of the recipients and their work, but also to our own community through these lectures, the conversations that happen uh, in the studios and around the building and their time spent out in the community, which is the ceramic perspective of everyone uh, that they touch in their time here as residents and for the fellows as they're building their portfolios for their business presentations that happen in January and February. Uh, tonight, Focus of attention, uh, Rebecca Chapel and Hank, who's her down a little bit more, uh, joined us at the beginning of January for her three month term as NCC's Winter at Night Resident Artist of 2020. Uh, Rebecca received her BFA from the Cleveland, Cleveland Institute of Art in 2003, her MFA from the New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University in 2008. Uh, following a year in Minneapolis, uh, she's staff with this for this term. Uh, in 2008, as one of the emerging artists and residents, uh, she headed back east to Philadelphia, where she currently resides. Uh, in Philadelphia, Rebecca has been a long-term resident artist and instructor at the Clay Studio, and for the last eight years, she's been teaching at Maryland Institute College of Art. Uh, her work has been shown both in both show and group exhibitions across the U.S. and representing this part of the University of Collection. Uh, inspired by the environment surrounding her, where she lives and works, uh, Rebecca composes her pieces uh, while utilizing both real prone and hand built techniques. Reaching beyond the concept of pots and functionality, Rebecca strives to push the limits of her user's relationship with form while respecting the parameters of action. Turning the light over while I shut these ones out. Rebecca Chapel. <laughs> Ah, further. <laughs> I can like hide a little bit. Um, can can everybody hear me? If I ever get where you can't just yell, uh, and I'll talk louder. Um, so yeah. Um, thanks to the McKnight Foundation, um, I get to be here for three months till end of March, which is really cool. And all I have to do is work in my studio, which is amazing opportunity. Um, it's a real gift. Um, and they let me bring my dog, which is great. <laughs> um, so thank you for having me. Um, this slide talk, I just did like a, a, like, here's my ceramics career from, you know, and just to go through it. So I would, uh, <clears throat> oh, yeah. I grew up in Indiana, out in cornfields. Um, my art class would just like go for a half hour to this room and sit and draw. We didn't have ceramics or, or anything like that. I guess I shouldn't say that. We did like a couple of clay projects, um, but that, it, that was about it. Um, what was weird, this is by my house. You can't out of the way. <laughs> Um, is my uh, first real introduction to ceramics was, I don't know how this happened, but my senior year of high school, a woman from the town two over um, brought a wheel to my, my high school. And I just remember we, we all stood there and watched her and I was mesmerized so much to the point that I went up and talked to her. Um, which was very uh, strange for me because I really didn't talk or approach people at all when I was younger, um, but it just threw me in. And she um, taught these classes every Saturday. I could go over to Muncie, Indiana and in the basement of this um, art supply store, we could throw on the wheel and I loved it. it um, like just sparked this fire in me like nothing else just to be able to touch the material I didn't even care if I made anything it was just I looked forward to it all week to go Saturday um, <clears throat> so 
My next stop, um, I went to the Cleveland Institute of Art. This is the gloomy Cleveland um, <laughs> city line. <laughs> um, it's a picture of the school. Um, when I went, it was a five-year program. So you had two full years of uh, foundations and then you could apply to uh, different departments. And I thought I'd apply to drawing and I'd taken a, uh, elective ceramics class and my teacher, um, these are my two teachers, those cardboard cutouts. So Bill Gray <laughs> and Judith Salomon. And Judith pulled me aside and she said, well, oh, what are you going to apply for? And I said, oh, you know, drawing. And she said, no, you're going to do ceramics. You can draw whenever you want. And I said, oh. <laughs> so I became a ceramics major. And these two, um, and they still are. Like whenever on the way home, I'll stop in Cleveland and go to Bill's studio. They're just like my ceramic parents. Um, they really um, just shaped me as a, a young artist and um, a maker. And Bill was here for the McKnight. I don't know how many years ago. Some of you might have been here. Bill Briard. Oh, yeah. He's crazy. I think he fired the wood kiln like by himself four times during his McKnight or something crazy. Um, he's a great potter, sculptor. Um, he's up in the gallery. Yeah, he's in the gallery. Yep. So these are just some places that um, around Cleveland that I found myself um, wandering around in old sort of industrial ruins. This is the Lakeview Cemetery, which is an amazing place if you ever get to um, Cleveland, Ohio. Let's see. And right across the street um, from the school was the um, Cleveland Museum of Art, which was nuts. I had only been to the Indianapolis Museum of Art, which was nuts too for me. And I remember going in here. This was like part of our classroom. You could just walk over and like look at this stuff. It blew me away. It's like we can go here whenever we want. Um, and I remember I saw, oh, it's kind of cut off, but I saw this and it really, um, it really stopped in my tracks and it still does today. Um, this Song Dynasty um, wine cup and stand. And um, I really loved um, everything about it, um, especially of, I, I really enjoy like, to me, this is like, what happens when you put something on a pedestal? It's like all about the saucer, you know, and like without, <laughs> without the pedestal, the cup um, doesn't have quite as much importance. And I use that a lot in my work, like, uh, what does the pedestal do, you know, to elevate things and make them more important? Um, just a couple images of my, <laughs> my uh, excuse me, my uh, undergrad work. So these were from my show. Bill showed me how to make really big things out of multiple parts, and it blew my mind that I could do that. And I went nuts and made all of these really tall shapes um, in different subtle colors um how tall are they oh the one on that taller guy on the right image i don't know it's like this maybe what is that three three feet. Three feet. yeah they were not i went crazy <laughs> um, <laughs> and sort of made these uh these still lives and uh really color pattern just confused and well, it really scared me, but it just like I couldn't handle it. It was like overwhelming. I'm like, I just got this how I wanted it. And they're like, now what do you do? And I'm like, I'm gonna make it white. <laughs> you know, so it's really just it, I remember it's just overwhelming. So a lot of my work um up until graduate school was uh mainly one color and very uh much about form. So and this is a dinnerware set, uh all white um, from my undergrad show. So <laughs> 2004 to 2006, um, after undergrad, I got the materials tech job 
here at the Northern Clay Center for those two years. Um, and I learned so much from that, um, from that job and that program. I worked under Pete Scherzer and Irene, his wife, and I got to work with McKnight artists that rotated like every three months. It was nuts. My first McKnight artist is now the department head of the college where I teach, mm -hmm. David East. Yeah, it was nuts. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> see, so here I really got um, into like a lot of glaze health and I learned a lot on my own about um, Blaze formulation. This is a blue celadon on porcelain um, <laughs> fired in the wood kiln in a stagger. <laughs> like, <laughs> like old, keeping it to tradition. I was like, I wonder if I could do that. I know it's silly, right? But I did it and I was like, oh, it works. <laughs> so, um, I learned about soda firing here, which was amazing. It's these big jars. Um, and learned how to soda fire, learned how to um, wood fire. I remember they let me tag along with like a Linda Christensen um, wood fire workshop and um, learned all about that. So these little jars, it was just a great time. When I look back on it, I learned so much from this place, you know, and it, it, um, it was great and it is great. So <clears throat> I remember after my two years, Pete was like, well, what are you going to do? And I said, can I just stay here? <laughs> he said, well, maybe, but you should probably apply to graduate school. Or, and he said, you should apply to the school. And so I did. And he helped me with my images and he read through my essay and um, I got in and I was like, oh, shit, Pete, I got in. <laughs> and then, so I, I went and I got lucky and I got to go to this great school um, in the middle of nowhere in uh, upstate New York. And I had no idea what, um, <clears throat> I didn't know what grad school really was. I thought I'm going to get feedback. That was what I went in with. Um, and this is some of the first work. Uh, it's really reminiscent of that Song Dynasty um, image that I showed before. And the two main sort of uh, points looking back that I was sort of questioned on were color. And I ended up like really getting into specific use. So I said, why are you making your pots like blue celadon and uh, using Temaku and all these um, really historical glazes. And they're like, I just like the color. And they're like, well, if you put blue celadon on porcelain, you just have China added to your work. And I'm like, ah, oh, okay. And with specific use, um, I, I work well within like, um, like uh, parameters. Like it's always been hard as somebody says, oh, make a bowl. I said, well, what kind of bowl? What's it going to, you know, I need like a fence to work in and sort of uh, really like the intensity of a restricted space. Um, and those are things that, um, that I really um, was looking back, thinking about quite a bit in graduate school. So for color, um, which kind of overwhelms me, um, the way uh, nature, uses color or functional color, I guess, because some man-made uh, industrial things use color and pattern in a functional way. I don't think I put any images um, of that in the slide talk, but poison dart frog, don't eat me, you know, like color that um, has a function. Disruptive patterning got super in the uh, camouflage um, and still in. Uh, in the camouflage, <clears throat> sort of these, the way this bird uses his uh, red sort of patches and to puff them up as a warning. More disruptive patterning, the stripes on a zebra. And this is just a shot of my backyard. And um, one of my one of my jobs, my money maker job, <laughs> is 
I work for a garden designer in Philly, so I'm outdoors all the time. And I have this backyard where my landlord just said I could do whatever I want. So I spend a ton of time outside and find um, a lot of inspiration, like planting things and like, how do I attract dragonflies? Or like, how do I get, you know, monarchs to come um, and find a lot <coughs> of inspiration just being out and about. <laughs> So um, specific use, this is like one of my favorites. It used to really disgust me, but I loved it. Um, and I, I, it's like, those are the objects that I, I like have learned to hang on to, or it's not like, ooh, I like that, or ooh, I hate it. But it's like, I kind of hate that, but I want to keep looking at it. Like the <laughs> uncomfortable things, and like something's there. And I love this. It's a drinking um, service. I can't remember which queen i think it's a russian queen i have it written down somewhere for drinking chocolate this is all it's just like porcelain and gold and like the spoons at the top that's crazy right it's, it's like over the top um i love these pots these chilla pots from korea um <clears throat> everything's on a stand they pierce the stand some of them this is a bad image but it's through glass. I love this one. <laughs> like they're fired in a wood kiln. So like every once in a while in the wood kiln one will like shift. So they're kind of animated and kind of like humorous in a way, which I really like. Looks like falling over. Um, ooh, I love these. These are dormouse jars and they're from Roman times because they like to eat these mice and they would put see the picture it's a mouse in the bottom like this is where the mouse goes and then they have all of these little shelves that they would put food in and then ramps so that the mouse had to exercise up the ramp get the food and then go back down so they wanted to like fatten them up and muscle them up and they would they would cook them with like drenched in honey and dates as a delicacy and like the breezing holes isn't that crazy it's like such a such a great object. <laughs> You're like, oh, of course. <laughs> like, you know, like um, this is a barber's basin. Uh, I forget where this one came from. I just love how he's like, here's all my tools. You put this on your neck. Uh, this is beautiful objects. Um, <laughs> this is a, 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 a coffin. Um, for burial, Minoan. There's just like massive slab often that you would, uh, I, I think I was reading you like live with this in your house and then you die and they like fold you in there and then put it under your house and you're dead. It's just like, massive. It's so great. <laughs> um, that's clay. clay, yeah. Yeah. Low fire. <clears throat> Yeah, if anyone, I have all the specifics written down. I'm not great at like keeping that stuff in my head, but if you want to, you can always ask me and I could uh, look it up for you. So this little object, um, one of the great things about uh, uh, graduate school was the, the object library. And there's a woman, Susan, and she's so great. And she really, really wants you to come look and handle the pots. And she knew I liked these little wine cups and um, and she emailed me and she said, ooh, Rebecca, I pulled out some stuff, come. And she was, she's so excited for you to look. And it blew my mind um, holding this thing versus what I had just learned about it from an image. Um, I had in my mind imagined these things being really perfect, sort of really light and refined. And this thing is so heavy and crude. And we were just there a couple months ago and she turned it over. And you can't really tell, but it's, it's literally just like a saucer that someone took a hammer and they like cracked and they jammed like a cup through there and glazed it together. And it really uh, stuck in my head as um, something doesn't have to be well, like whatever perfect, but thin and uh, I don't like to use that word, but you know what I mean. Uh, really refined to, to have this um, sort of uh, elegance to it. 
it was very direct. It really, it really um, stuck in my head <clears throat> for a while. So these are just some images from grad school. This, my friend, his dad would send him these really fancy dark chocolates. And these were like little grain silos from Indiana that I grew up next to. So the bottom is a little spot for one little chocolate. They're super tiny, uh, three parts. And then you lift off and there's a little plate and you can put it under the little dome. So the pot for one chocolate. Um, started making these three-part um, flower vases for daffodils. Um, so there are three parts and water goes in the bottom. And the idea was that um, these are really small too. They're like four inches by four inches um, wide without the flowers. So a couple of tablespoons of water um, that if you wanted the flowers to survive, you had to actually um, care for it and pay attention to it and give it water every day. Um, I learned about the Victorian language of flowers in grad school um, and got really into that and how you could speak and tell people these things that you weren't allowed to say just by giving them like a bouquet of flowers or leaving flowers on their doorstop like any like really specific things too like anything from like I love you but like a sister to like I want you to die and all your children <laughs> just like leave it um so um the daffodil met um uh regard like thinking about something over and over and while I was in grad school my my older sister um, actually, right when I left here, she was diagnosed with leukemia, and um, I would uh, go back, and I was her bone marrow donor, and I'd go back and give her sort of blood products, and every few months from graduate school, um, and this piece, it like really became sort of a meditation grieving piece. Um, looking back on it. Um, that you had to pay attention to these, these little vases on um, if you wanted the flowers and the daffodils, sort of they all sat on this wall that I floated off of the ground just a couple inches. And they all sort of um, were connected and made this yellow line of, um, of daffodils at the top. And just some close-ups. <clears throat> Like they all had to fit within a imaginary like four inch by four inch cube, and they're all like interchangeable parts um, with the different types. There's just some images from my MFA show, little um, whiskey cup island. There's plates and lily of the valley in the background. Plates. Oh, the, yeah, these are uh, little individual stands for one cake. <laughs> and I thought it was great because at my MFA review, we all ate cake. And I was like, they have to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> How can you hate it? It's pink. <laughs> it's pink. <laughs> um, just some bigger versions of those little guys. So what I did skip is I did come back here and I was a Fogelberg for one year in between grad school and Colorado State. <laughs> so that, it's okay. So I put this in, it's my first teaching um, position and this is where quarter squares and rectangles happen and it blew my mind. So um, it was a sabbatical replacement and um, I was the only teacher there. I was replacing Sanam Imami for one semester. And she showed me what I had to teach the students. And it was like coil building, slab building. And I was like, oh my God, I don't know how to do that stuff. Like, because I picked up the wheel really fast, but I had literally not coil built, slab built since I was 19 in undergrad. And it scared me because I thought they would all know that I sucked at it. <laughs> so a week before classes started, I went in and I did all of their assignments really quickly. 
before and uh, before they came in. And after having years of experience with the material, I was like, holy crap, I can coil build and slab build and I can make a square. It blew my mind. It was, the, I think for like the whole next year, I just made squares and I like pinch squares and like corners and people um, like, what are you doing? Like, I'm making squares. You know, when you're on the wheel, it's like everything's round, everything's symmetrical. I still have a hard time with um, most things being symmetrical. It's, it's fine, but um, this is like a, a pinched um, coil base, and I use a lot of props. Like, these are flowers for the paintbrushes, and it's got this like submersible uh, submarine thing that you can put in the water. So um, after that year in Colorado, I heard about the um, the clay studio and they had this um, really fantastic fellowship opportunity that has since lost its funding. Um, I think they had one person after me, but it was the Evelyn Shapiro um, Foundation. And you basically got to work in your studio for a whole year and they paid you. <laughs> and you, you got a, a show at the end and like, you didn't have to work. I taught classes um, for a little extra money, but it was, it was nuts. There was like work in your studio. So um, I proposed that I wanted to work on hand building for um, that year. So I made a rule, you're not allowed to use the wheel for the first six months. So I made my wheel into a table um, and I just pinched and pinched. I met really great people. My really good friend, Linda Lopez, um, I met there. Um, Hiroe Hanazono, fantastic slip caster. Uh, Michael Fujita, who I was in grad school with and then we were at the play studio <laughs> together. Peter Morgan, who's <laughs> fantastic. Um, so it was really great. Some images. Am I doing okay on time? Okay. Um, some images. Oh, we're right by the river there in Philly. So <clears throat> it's a really surreal image. You're driving like by Ikea and the river's to the right. And there's this old luxury liner that just sits. Um, on the, it's too expensive to like do anything with, so just sit there. It's weird. Um, and out my studio window, I could see these huge barges going down the Delaware. They're, they're massive. It looks like like a building that's shifting. Um, the Philadelphia Zoo, I would go to a lot um, to look at patterning and animals. Uh, Reading Terminal Market, Market is one of my favorite places. It's it's like sensory overload food flowers. So if like if I get stuck sometimes, I'll go in there just to get inspiration. This is the chocolate place. This is my favorite. Like look at all the colors. It's like oh, like I want to use that yellow. So I'm gonna make something for lemons. It's cool flowers. I love this place. Uh, Longwood Gardens is another of my favorite places to go to. This is during the Chrysanthemum Festival. Mm -hmm. Things nuts, right? I forget the it's like the thousand star. I might have made that up. Chrysanthemum. It's, it's amazing. It's one plant. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's one. And you look under there, it's like in a little pot. It's nuts. Look it up. <laughs> wow. um, some of the uh, the lily pond at Longwood Gardens. There's so much stuff in Philadelphia. Um, so this was one of the first pieces I wanted to make a floating white rectangle, um, kind of like the yellow striped daffodil. So these are all pinched, coiled. Um, and I wanted to switch to earthenware. One, so that I could, um, I was really tired of moving from place to place to place to place. And when you do count 11 salt fired porcelain, it's like you have to go where the kiln is. And that gets really lonely and hard. And um, 
I was tired of it. It was just like, oh, if I switch to low fire, I can have a little kiln. It cost me three dollars to fire my kiln, a whole kiln load. I can use color, which I was really interested in um, pushing myself as far as patterning and color. Um, and I can make I can make a home if I want to. So. <clears throat> Um, these are these are like a weird little series that were just kind of like color studies, and I've never gone back to it um, yet. They're strange; they kind of stick out. These are uh, coiled and then patterned. I was looking at those razzle dazzle ships from World War One. I. I, I don't have an image of those, but just put in razzle dazzle camouflage, and it's crazy. Um, you'll see the connections. These are. Uh, pinch. They're probably like 27 inches big. They're rather big, like fruit baskets. There's a little guy. I think this one might be thrown and slab and cut. Um, and these are just some images from uh, um, after the six months, I allowed myself to go back on the wheel and I started um, using the wheel and um, altering hand building and sort of just combining it all together. So this is thrown, altered, slab. I don't think there's any coil in there. So thrown and altered <clears throat> fruit basket. There's a lemon barge. It's like two cylinders caught stuck together, slabs on the bottom. Um, there's some process images for the show images at all. Um, show you but i often uh work this way where I, I really need to stage it in my studio or use props or um to, i built this sort of um little pedestal so i could see how it was coming together and i'll, I'll fire them in different stages and sometimes i'll glaze them and put them in and not like do it all at once but kind of like a drawing um so this is the image of that piece uh, after it was uh, glaze fired and there's with the flowers. So I just wanted to make a red carpet. It was called red carpet. I just wanted to make a, a rectangle of red flowers. So okay. I, um, Philadelphia. So this is the clay studio, the end show from that year um, of the, the fellowship. And there's thrown dancing plates across the um, back this um lemon this came from seeing lemons at the market and it sort of exploded from there <clears throat> so the centerpiece of thrown and altered and slab built um weirdness um let's see I'm gonna go a bit faster. These are just some shows. The uh, airport show at Philly. They have a great, um, a great program at the Philadelphia airport. And I wanted to make a clay drawing that sort of matched the the activity of the airport, where you're coming and going, coming and going, sort of um, quickly up and down the aisles. Um, so that's what this piece came from. And oop and had these big centerpieces that sort of flanked it as a way to try to get people to stop for a minute um, in the airport. Is there a place of flowers for the show? They're fake. Oh, wow. I know, right, and fake fruit. They, they made such, yeah. I don't know, they have the spot and then they gave me all the fake stuff afterwards, mm -hmm. which was really cool. High quality fakes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see, just some process images at the end. Um, so this is a building that I came across walking, um, Hank, and this is a horrible image, but it's got this huge, uh oh, did I do something? I think I hit something on, it stopped. Oh, there it goes. So it's got this gigantic window with this big green frame. I have no idea what the deal is, but um, it stopped me in my track. So I made this um, big piece <clears throat> for pineapple and flowers. Um, you'll see that I love the pineapple and symbology of the pineapple. 
So um, these are just some process images of how um, I work. So big throne piece, slabs on the side. I always have like the pineapple or a stand-in so I can see those are the flower stand-ins so I can see how everything will look with um, the stuff in it. Um, sort of map it out and glaze some parts, um, take them out of kiln, put them back in the kiln. And I'll always, this was a, a, a full-size test pile. So I'll make like a full-size piece that's just a waster. So I can send it through the kiln kind of sometimes until it cracks just to figure out the colors and the patterns to scale as well as with drawing. So then this is the final piece with the um, flowers <clears throat> installed. So this is a start of a, a lantern set. So thrown and squared cylinders. Um, this is some fake candles. I'm starting to build the um, pieces together. The back piece is a lantern. Ta-da! <laughs> Um, I do use drawing quite a bit, especially to figure out um, the pattern and the color. Um, and I try to draw to scale if I can, um, just to help me see it before it um, <clears throat> comes out of the kiln. Um, really love these uh, Pennsylvania German factor drawings. They're um, like birth certificates, wedding certificates, but the little pattern to the right and left of the bird became like the pants for this guy. <laughs> I'm going really long, aren't I? Am I okay? I'm almost yeah, done. All right, so um, this is kind of the, the last that brings me to here. So I got this independence grant through the Clay Studio, and I, I got to go to, you like write it and they give you money. I got to go to London, and I got to go to the v &A, which was nuts. Um, if you ever are able to go there, it's crazy. Their ceramic collection is really struck by these large terracotta um, Delrobia. Where is it? This is in London. The Victoria and Albert <coughs> Museum. Yeah. Love these guys. Um, just really love the bold color <clears throat> with these like heavy sculptural elements. This is a section of the ceramic library. It's like this is, yeah, and nobody's up there. So you're just up there by yourself, like messing around. It's crazy. Like, look, it's nuts. Um, floors and floors and floors. Really love this guy, which you'll see looks a lot. Um, you can see where I'm using that. Uh, I took a class with the food historian, Ivan Day, on Victorian uh, pie making, like meat pies. Some images from, his, from one of his books. Um, we used the old, uh, all the old tools that he always used. It was a lot like working with clay. It was like basically slab building to make. Let's see the like sprig mold. These are some of the original tools that we use. <laughs> and there's the end product, this like meat pie with like an egg and pistachios. It's, it's basically one of the first first ways to like uh, uh, keep your meat. Like this would be your meat for a couple weeks. They pour a, a gelatin over it to preserve cold meat, you know, before refrigeration. It was really good. Yeah. Okay. Just wants to snuggle. <laughs> um, this, I forget which thing. It was a gigantic meat pie for one of the queens. There were like all these dudes carrying it. Um, here's Ivan Day. Um, doing some of these sugar casting um, centerpieces, which they're really interested in, and also have like a ceramic connection to them. It's a bad image. Um, um, and lastly, I got to go to Chelsea Physic Garden, which is an old apothecary um, garden in London. Um, medicinal plants for doctors. 
This one was just cool. They use the little spines of the cactus for um, gramophones back in the day. Oh, yeah, it's cool, right? And a few things currently stuck in my mind. I don't know how to speak about them too much other than they just sit there and they don't leave. So I don't know what will come of them. Love the gold. <laughs> Nana, I'm almost done. <laughs> we'll just go through these. Please, like gold uh, fingertips and toes um, for burial in Egypt. Beautiful. Uh, that on the left uh, is a uh, uh, export uh, China from China um, for a European market. Um, and it's a soup terrine, so the nose holes are open. So when there's hot, like food in there, <laughs> smoke comes out. Yeah. Like, I really love the theatrical aspect of uh, banquet dining. <clears throat> love it. These are just some curtains that somebody painted on a board of that building in Philly, which I really love. <laughs> Make it look a little nicer. I don't know. And I saw this at House We Were Gardening from it. I don't know too much about it, but I think it's a New England tradition that they do. Um, I, still, I don't know what it is. It's just some images from the people that we garden for. So I, if I don't get to use uh, clay, I, I, I get to like paint and play around with plants all the time, um, keep my hands in dirt, uh, if not in clay. And so here, I was um, um, working on uh, more of that sort of uh, myolica, which um, I'd really like to do some testing on. Um, I want to work on making some press molds, which I've never done molds before, this mold, so that I don't um, just depend on the wheel for building big base forms. If I had some big um, molds that I could uh, pound out and just build off of, um, I think would be really cool. The idea for a, a charger for a plate. Um, this is just some of the stuff um, like that I'll be working in my studio. Just like these weird fruit things where a pineapple sits on top. There are lanterns, this is for the wall. Um, I don't really know where they're going or what um, they're heading towards, but they're keeping my brain um, interested. So let's stick with it for a minute. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> and this is a pile of oranges I made in the studio back the other day. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you.